Hey everyone, it's uh, Joseph. Um, I uh, I want to send the lesson that, that we had done uh, this past Wednesday because, admittedly, you know why while I do um, I, I do very much base my approach on saying you know you don't need every single aspect, you don't need keywords, etc. I will I do have to say that this this first one is a it's a good foundation. Um, pun intended you'll you'll see what I mean so uh, pretty much my goal for this class what we looked at um, for those who were present we but you know because I'm not gonna say to you uh, we believe this because the Catholic Church believes it and leave it at that because if the Catholic Church isn't right well, then I there's no basis for you to believe anything I might teach you so Instead, I mean, we, we have to slowly build the case for Catholicism. You know, we, we have to look at a lot, a lot. Um, I actually, I'm pretty sure it's maybe class number seven that we finally come to a form of a conclusion in uh, Catholicism. So today, though, that this very first lesson, um, my goal is only to establish Peter in the Gospels as the foundation of uh, Jesus' church. That's that's pretty much it. Like, I, I found, that's it, right? So one thing that's very key to note is that Peter, he's the primary apostle in the Gospels, um, you know, in, in matter of being mentioned, etc. And he's mentioned more than every other disciple combined. Uh, over 190 times. Next, we have we have John. He's around 48. And then um, uh, Philip, around 12. Philip or Andrew? I can't remember. Um, I, I can't remember who the image is of either. Now, whenever we read about more than one apostle, like a list, Peter is listed first. There are two exceptions, but don't worry about that. Um, so some examples, Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 5, Luke chapter 6, Mark chapter 16, and Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. So, you know, reading, reading through these, you can see Peter is, I mean, in the upper right one, Mark chapter 16, verse 7, it literally says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. You know, the person speaking could have left that go and tell his disciples, etc. No, no, they, they specifically named Peter. And um, an area where we can definitely see the importance, the, the um, how to say, the preeminence of Peter is in the book of Acts. And we read about a, a Roman centurion, and we read, it. now in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. One afternoon he saw plainly in a vision an angel of God say to him, Cornelius, your prayers and almsgiving have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send some men and summon one Simon, who is called Peter. So just to kind of put this into context, so Cornelius is praying, right? He's turning to God, he is asking God for help, and what does God the Father do? He literally sends an angel, one of his angels, and says uh, that this Peter guy, Simon, Simon Peter, yeah, go find him. He'll help you. Like Peter is the answer to the prayers of Cornelius. Personally, I'd say that makes him pretty important. But why? Why? Why is he so special? Um, John chapter twenty-one. It says, uh, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And uh, the phrase for more than these, it actually just meant, do you love me more than these here do? Uh, and St. Augustine, he writes that Jesus was just talking about the other disciples. So, just a little explanation when he says, do you love me more than these? He's, he's probably pointing around the table at the other disciples. So, um... And we continue, Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And 
Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Now, the, the concept here of sheep, hold on to that, hold on to that for now. We're going to see this idea pop up later. Um, for now, though, I, I want to look at an incredibly important verse for, uh, Chris, for all Christians to know, which is Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement, and then I'm, and then I'm going to lay out every single argument for it. Um, my statement is simply, Peter, St. Peter is the foundation for the Roman Catholic Church. Boom. Done. Like, that's, that's my claim here, right? Um, but, you know, and, and I'm, I'm saying that based mostly off of this verse right here, but uh, there are a lot of arguments against it, of course. Uh, some, they argue that in Greek, the word for rock, right, upon this rock, is Petra. Now, Petra, you know, it, it means a massive stone. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this Petra, I will build my church. But the word for Peter's new name, it's different. It's actually Petros, which it means pebble. Um, so if, I mean, if we were to read it, be, you are, you are a pebble and upon this massive stone, I'll build my church. I, I don't like that. I, we we got to deal with that, right? So this, I will say, yes, this is true in Greek, except not the Greek that, uh, the Bible was written in. Th this difference in meaning, we can actually only see it in what is called Attic. Greek. Uh, it's the dialect of Athens. But the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, common Greek. And in Koine Greek, both Petros and Petra, they meant rock. So the same word, right? You are rock, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Um, now, as an aside, if uh, Matthew did want to use the word, you know, want to refer to Peter as like a small stone, something like that. He could have used uh, lithos or psephos, but, because those were existing words, meaning, you know, meaning a small rock, but we don't see those here. But don't worry, I'm not just going to leave it at this. I'm not going to say, oh, look, Catholics are right because this, the, the words are, they're, they're not different. No, no, no. There's another way that we can ensure that we are interpreting Jesus' words correctly, and that is by looking at what is called the Aramaic. Now, Aramaic, um, it was basically a revised form of Hebrew, and it was the language that Jesus and the apostles all spoke. Um, you know, so we, the New Testament was written in Greek, uh, but that was purely for the audience. Everyone in the New Testament, I mean, almost everyone, spoke Aramaic. And Eight times in the Greek New Testament, we find the Aramaic form of Peter's new name. So Peter's new name, Petros, we, we see the Aramaic form in the Greek New Testament. And in English Bibles, it's written as, uh, people pronounce it as Cephas. Um, now, Cephas, it's, it's not Greek. Um, what it is, is a try to explain this briefly. It's called a transliteration. Pretty much Greek, Aramaic, they have different, um, you know, actually I'll do this. Look at the middle of your screen, um, you know, under Dwayne the Rock Johnson, and uh, there's that, that, that first word that says Petros. Well, a transliteration isn't going to necessarily translate it, because the translation is, um, you know, is, is Peter, Rock, but transliteration simply says, this is how we would spell it in our alphabet. 
so it would be P E T R O S. That's so quick. Uh, I don't know linguistics lesson. That that's what that is. So <sighs> Cephas, the word here on the left, um, that is a transliteration of the Aramaic word kefa. Now, what does kefa mean? Well, it it means a rock. This is the same as petra. It does not mean a pebble. So I mean, what Jesus said to Peter was. You are kefa, and upon this kefa, I will build my church. Now, um, a, uh, I believe he was seventh century, seventh century, uh, father of father of the church. His name was Saint Isidore of Seville. He wrote that he is called Cephas because he had been set at the head of the apostles for kefale. And Greek means head, and the name is Syrian for Peter. Um, and side note, the, the image here, it's actually kind of cool. This is the, I tracked down the earliest image we have of the manuscript that this, this quote came from, and that's, that's what it looks like, so fun fact. But um, there's an issue with this whole thing we just talked about. If Kepha is the same as Petra. Why don't we read in the Greek, you are Petra, and upon this Petra, I will build my church? Why, you know, just use the same word twice. Why doesn't he use Petros um, for both if, you know, if, if they're synonyms? Well, it's, if, if you've ever taken like a foreign language, or you know anything about foreign language, you might be familiar with um, gender endings. Um, you know, masculine, feminine, neuter, etc. Um, so Greek, oh goodness, I have a reminder from Google right now. That's what the noise is. There are some reminders for Joseph. <sighs> Sorry about that. Um, so Greek nouns, they have gender endings. So Petra is feminine, you know, because you have the, the hro and the alpha at the end. Um, so that that's feminine, and you can't use it as Peter's new name. So Matthew, he has to change the noun to make it masculine. So to do that, you know, he would add the Rho Omicron Sigma, which would give us, or the ROS, which would give us Petros. Um, oops. Petros, <laughs> meaning rock. Now, um, some... Some people, they, they do claim that Jesus, he's not referring to Peter because he says upon this rock instead of upon you. You know, I, I would say yes, that, that's actually a very, that is a valid point. Why doesn't he say you are Peter and upon you I will build my church? That would clear up a lot of confusion, right? Well, again, we got to do my favorite thing. We have to look to the Greek. Now, the word this on you know on your screen, the one that is very clearly stands out. Uh, the word used for this, it's written as thote te, um, which I mean literally it means this the. Um, so upon this the rock, you know, to, to us it doesn't really mean anything, doesn't really affect anything. But <sighs> boring grammar lesson, I'm sorry. So thote te, it's a demonstrative construction. It's uh, blah, blah, blah. And it points to Peter, the subject of the sentence as the rock on which Jesus has built his church. So he's saying, you are Peter, and upon, and when he says this, the this points to Peter. So, you know, it works. So Peter now, he is called rock. Wonderful. Why does it matter? You know, what, what, what has been affected? Well, when God changes a person's name, he, he changes their status. Um, for example, in the Old Testament, the founder of the Jewish faith, uh, Abraham, he is called Rock. You know, so the foundation of uh, the Jewish people, he is also called Rock. The prophet Isaiah writes, Look to the rock from which you are hewn. To the quarry from which you were taken, look to Abraham your father. Though he was but one, when I called him, I blessed him and made him 
many. Now, if we were to, you know, put Peter's name in here, that, I mean, that would still work, wouldn't it? But we're, we're still going to, we're going to keep going with it before we, because like I said, I don't want to form a conclusion if we've not addressed absolutely everything. Now, eh, all right, I have a quote in here um, from a man named Bishop Fortunatianus of Aquileia, but I don't, I don't know, I won't read it. It's, I think it's just an extra thing I threw in there, so yeah, take a look quick. It's just good insight. All right, so we know God can put people in charge of, of kingdoms on earth, right? Because we, we see that... Um, I mean, we, we see it with David, we see it with Solomon, all, all these people, right? But how can someone be a leader of the entire kingdom of God? Like, that's, that's pretty big. You know, if Jesus is saying, like, I will build my church and you will lead it. Uh, I mean, I, I was going to say, can you do that? He can do it, he's God. But, um, you know, we need, we need other examples of this. So... In the Old Testament, uh, the book of First Chronicles it says, Thereafter Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king succeeding his father David. And Ezekiel, again, Old Testament, uh, chapter 37 says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. They shall all have one shepherd. Hold up. Um, one shepherd. Now, you might remember earlier, I told you to remember the conversation Jesus had with Peter when he asks him three times, do you love me? And and he, he, he refers to um, lambs, sheep, and uh, sheep a third time, uh, or sheep another time. And, you know, so, so we see the, the shepherd, because all the things Christ was telling Peter to do to tend his lambs, feed his flock, etc. I mean, th that is what a shepherd does. So, David being the shepherd, and now, now we, in a way, in a way, we see Peter as a shepherd of the flock, the church of Christ. Now, another thing I want to look at in Matthew 16, um, you know, what do you think it means when Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Because, um, I mean, that that's, it sounds pretty cool, but, okay, what does it mean? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, St. John Cassian, uh, another early church father, in the year 431, he, he wrote that the gates of hell are the belief, or rather the misbelief, of heretics. So, pretty much anything that is opposed to the church. Anything that is against the church built upon Peter is the gates of hell. Now, touchy subject here, but, um, I mean, obviously it has to be addressed. How do we know that the gates of hell didn't take over the church shortly after Peter died? And that the, you know, the, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s was how Protestants, you know, came and saved the day. How do we know? Now, um, okay, so I'll try to do this quick. So there's this idea um, among almost every Protestant um, brother and sister, you know, we, we call them because we love them all, of course, um, there's this idea called the Great Apostasy. Basically, huh, how to summarize, basically, um, they say that, you know, after Peter died, then Romans kind of added a bunch of pagan stuff, and, like, Constantine uh, came in and, and created Catholicism and all this stuff, and we'll get into most of that this year, but fun fact, None of it is historically true, and we can, it's very easy to prove, but, so they say that the gates of hell did take over. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's not good. 
but hold up, Jesus, he told the apostles, he says, quote unquote, make disciples of all nations and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So Jesus says, I am with you always. Like, I am always present. He didn't say, I'm with you until, until Peter dies. And then you guys are going to have to wait till the, the Reformation comes along, till Martin Luther comes and, and saves everything. Um, no, he says, I am with you always. Now, we know that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And if, if evil prevails, then, I mean, we could say goodness has failed. And if, as the Reformation claimed, goodness has failed in, in the Catholic Church, then Jesus was a liar. Because if, if goodness has failed, evil has prevailed. And Jesus said that would not happen because he's always with his church. And well, we know, we, we, we accept fully, and I mean, we can look at it a lot more if you'd like, but Jesus, um, you know, he was without sin and he couldn't have lied. Therefore, the church has not failed. <sighs> and as um, one of the greatest early theologians, um, I love him, his name is Origen, he said, but against whomsoever the gates of hell prevail, he is neither to be called a rock upon which Christ builds his church, neither a church or part of the church which Christ builds upon a rock. So he's basically saying, um, if, you know, if, if your Christian group, well, if it's not, if evil has prevailed, you are not a part of the church. The, at least, I'm sorry, the church that Christ built upon the rock of Peter. Um, so it's pretty heavy there, but I want to move on. We're, I'm, I'm wrapping up, don't worry. So in um, the 22nd chapter of Isaiah, going back to the Old Testament now, uh, God, at one point, he's speaking to Shevna. Now, Shevna, he's a, a ruler in the old kingdom of David. Um, and God, he says, I will thrust you from your office and pull you down from your station. So, you know, speaking to Shevna, we can see Shevna has, he's got a station. He, he has a, a public office. Um, well, I mean, I, I know none of you have worked in uh, a major corporation in the United States or wherever, but if, you know, if someone is being pulled from their office, from, from their station, um, they need a replacement. That, that, that's how it works. And um, God, he continues, he says, On that day I will summon my servant Eliachim. I will confer on him, or I will give him your authority. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Um, now, side note here. So, uh, Eliachim, he's called father here. Um, and now a synonym for, in person, I asked everyone for synonyms for father. It took us forever to get to the one I wanted, but um, papa, papa, right? Um, is a synonym for, for father. And fun fact, the, the word pope, it comes from the Greek papas, um, meaning priest or, or father. So just fun little you know, additional detail. Now God, he continues, speaking to Shevna. He says, I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one will shut, and what he shuts, no one will will open. So remember that, all right? So what he opens, no one will shut. What he shuts, no one will open. You know, I, I, and I will, I will give him the key. So what's up with this key thing? Now, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, you know, one, one verse after the others, Jesus, he says to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Oh, cool. We, we see that, you know, 
giving the keys thing again. Now, in scripture, the idea of keys is used to show authority. For example, Revelation chapter 9, it says, I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. It was given the key for the passage to the abyss. So, just, you know, just to show, I don't know, pretty much in the Bible, a key that acts as a key. It opens things. It, it's, it's for those who are in authority. And uh, Jesus, he, he continues. He says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, to bind and to loose something, the, these were Jewish terms that were, they meant to, uh, you know, to bind was to forbid. And to, to loose was to permit, to allow um, only though when referring to the interpretation of the law of Moses. So the Jews, you know, if a rule was bound, that means it was like, this is the rule, the end. This is it. Um, so thus, St. Peter, he was given the authority to interpret the rules for the church. And don't worry, I'm, I'm going to keep I'm going to work on this phrase a little bit more, but I do want to quick go back to the book of Isaiah. Remember, it says, I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one will shut, and what he shuts, no one will open. Now, Matthew chapter uh, 16, 19, it uses a rare Greek, uh, just a grammar tool, I'll call it, you don't have to remember this. It's just the future perfect paraphrastic tense. Um, obviously, that's what you guys are going to say. So what it's doing here, the phrase for uh, the shall be bound, it's a, it's rendered as estai lelomenon. Now, estai lelomenon, it literally means will have been bound. So I'll I'll say it in a different way. So whatever rules you make on earth, those rules will immediately be changed to be the to, to match your rule in heaven. So Peter was given the authority to to interpret the new law, the law of Christ, the rules, um, an interpretation of of the rules of the church. And there are a lot of conditions. We're going to look at them uh, several classes from now, but. So that's pretty big, this, this new authority. Now, an old church father, um, he's a favorite of mine, his name is Tertullian, and he wrote, If the Lord has said to Peter, Upon this rock will I build my church, and um, to you have I given the keys of the heavenly kingdom, what sort of man are you? Completely changing the intention of the Lord. So, I mean, he's in, in what? third century, he's calling people out who are saying, um, oh no, the, the church, it wasn't built on Peter, it was built upon uh, people say, you know, his, his confession of faith, his, all these different things. They say, no, he's saying it, I'll, I'll build the church upon myself, Jesus. No. And Tertullian's like, who, who are you to come along and say, no, no, that's not what Jesus meant, he actually meant this. He says, on you, he says, well, I build my church, and I will give to you the keys. Um, another quote from Origen, mentioned him earlier. He just says, when one does not, um, I'll kind of, I'll translate it. Okay, so when one, when, when someone doesn't, you know, change, uh, when they change a rule of God, um, but they don't, don't do it with the authority that Jesus gave to Peter. The gates of hell prevail against him. But in the case of anyone against whom the gates of hell do not prevail, this man, uh, it says, judges righteously. So th this man is, is from Peter. And upon this person, the church is built. And one last quote, then we're pretty much done. Around the year 254, St. Uh, Cyprian of Carthage, he 
said that because Peter was made the first bishop. You know, because Jesus, he established a hierarchy. He established a, a line of, of rulers. And we're, we're going to explore that in a lot of detail. Not too much, though. I don't want to make it too boring. But he says, because Peter was made the first bishop, through the changes of times and successions, the ordering of bishops and the plan of the church flow onwards. So that the church is founded upon the bishops and every act of the church is controlled by these same rulers. So, I mean, what, what we believe from all of this, um, you know, so, so, so the Jesus established his church upon Peter. And Peter had an office, just like Shevna, remember? Now, well, if Peter uh, steps down or dies or something from his office, whoever takes his place, they are still a part of that foundation from Jesus. And as Catholics, we believe that that is the, what we call the Bishop of Rome, or the Pope. But there's an issue, one thing we have to look at. If, did St. Peter live and, you know, live, rule in and die in Rome? Because if he didn't, well, then Catholics are wrong. So we're going to be looking at that next class. Um, for now, though, I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to this. Um, and if you could, oh, here we go. If you could uh, send me an email or have your parents send me an email with a keyword uh keyword will be um candle just candle the end so just have your parent email that to me and i'll know you you listened so i appreciate it uh blessings to you all and thank you